So, hey, Rob. Sweet. I see a red light. Yeah, I see, hey, I Jersey. see a red light, too. But that doesn't mean what, what you might think it means. It just means, it doesn't mean stop. It means go. It means it's time to talk about art and challenging ourselves. Uh, or not, uh, as we'll find out when we get into the topic of the day. Um, thought of the day, Rob. Uh, Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com and leanintoart.com. Uh, I want I want I want to get a uh, a cello version of the Lean Into Art theme really bad. <laughs> a cello version. You remember huh? that band uh, Apocalyptica? Is that what they called themselves? Sure. Yeah, Apocalyptica. Yeah. They, they? I think I have their first CD. Uh, God, they, they did a version of one of the Faith No More songs. I can't remember which one it was, but uh, it was amazing sounding. Just like it's like what six guys with cellos just doing versions of heavy metal songs. Um, mm-hmm. And I was and I was. Uh, when I was editing the last show, I was listening to the theme song. I was like, "Yeah, oh, you know, it'd be really cool." And, and like, like a, like a, for when we're doing like an especially profound episode, it's like it was the same song but just done with cello. Can you play cello? Tell me, you can play cello. <laughs> I have uh, access to a MIDI keyboard that can sound like cello, <laughs> and also I have uh, okay. Uh, well, what is it called? The uh, the Roland GR20 which allows me to play MIDI through my guitar. Can you add your so, own sounds to the MIDI keyboard, like Barking Dogs, to do a Barking yeah, Dogs version so. of the Lean Into Art theme? <laughs> Actually, I can't. I'm genetically predisposed where that would cause uh, spontaneous combustion. <laughs> so it, it's the weirdest uh, It would condition. kill everyone around you just instantly, and I don't know why, but it's weird. Uh, okay, well, that was my only thought of the day, was that I, I like the song, but I'd, I'd also like to hear different versions, like like a cello version, a banjo version. I think it'd be really cool to, to, to indicate the mood of the episode. There you go. More work for mm. you to do, because you've been working hard this last couple weeks, and uh, we hinted in the last episode that the Lean Into Art Store might be done by the time the episode went up, and lo and behold, it's up. It's totally up. Um adding this cello thing to my list <laughs> of, of no way I'm going to do it ever. No, I'm kidding. It won't sound like the Bucky no, the Vampire curious. Slayer theme then if you do it that way. It does. I know. It's definitely invoking that. Um, And there is one more, uh, by the way, not to jump back a topic, but um, there is a another Lean Into Art like theme song candidate, and I, I posted it on uh, where I well I'll occasionally post like music doodlings and stuff at uh, mysticalguitartribe.posterous.com. Mm. And uh, there's one more out there. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard that. I don't know. I have to listen to it now. Let's see if, let miss the fourth candidate. Mystical Guitar but, uh, Tribe. Yep. Did you use some G Kundo when you uh, built that site? Let's see. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, I'm not the, the kind of person who says, I built a CMS and I'm going to solve every problem that I ever face on the web with the one CMS that I built. So I choose to go with the CMS that's right for the situation. So you go with what's right for the situation. In other words, you don't adhere to a prescripted set of affordances and rules, uh, which means that you're breaking rules, which means you're cheating. Perhaps if I had, uh, I I could have mismanaged expectations to the world where you know I built the CMS. I've actually done it a few different times, but uh, latest one being Comic Caster, which um, definitely needs a source code update. But it's out there and it's free and it's on Google Code. But uh, I don't. Um, uh, I I love that CMS, but it's uh, it's not the only way. So I do cheat on it. But thankfully, it's not sentient. But Rob, so. okay, this, we're, I'm I, I'm jumping right to the topic, and we'll talk more about the Lean Into Art Store at the end. I guess I wanted to I wanted to put it on the front end this time, but but we're we're going now. Uh, Rob, if we don't have rules for things, if we don't have an adherence to systems uh, that we all agree upon, I mean, this was in a Super Friends episode. Laws are only laws when everybody agrees to obey them. Uh, then nothing has meaning. We've lost all meaning to what... What does cartooning even mean if there's a zillion ways to do it? There's got to be a way. There's got to be some definition and standardization of craft. Otherwise, we don't know what a cartoon is. We don't know what a story is. What kind of chaos are you living in, pal? Uh, Sorry, I threw a curveball. 
No, no, no. Actually, you, you just asked for a curveball. <laughs> uh, no, the uh, uh, what you you reminded me of an inter- interesting observation someone once made. Um, actually, really recently, they were they were talking about how um, when comics add motion and uh, possibly animated elements they no longer become oh, comics. Uh, yeah that, that, I've heard which that. struck me as funny because i'm a, i'm the chaos man right i i uh i look at it as um uh i've definitely utilized many conventions of it um i feel like i'm making comics so i get to say i'm making comics but then there's this guy he goes oh no <laughs> it's got the animation boot right out of my world <laughs> go dead to me <laughs> Yep. Oh, you know, it's funny because uh, I could totally see somebody saying like, oh, Jersey, you're always rallying against that guy who does that. Unless you do such and such and such and such, you can't be in our tribe. Um, but my argument would be is that this isn't arbitrary. This isn't me drawing a line in the sand saying like, oh, well, we have to define it. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Uh, it's partially uh, the whole motion thing comes out of the fact that I think comics inherent power resides in finding that perfect mo- that perfect static moment that communicates motion but doesn't actually use motion that when you see a cartoonist who can do that who can capture something where you're feeling the slump of somebody's shoulders or you're feeling the impact of a punch or you're feeling the um the slow fall of a person like falling off a cliff like whether they're falling like a million miles an hour or if it feels like time is stopping if you can capture that in still images that is what let me let me back up and say I always like to cherish the things that only comics can do. And when comics as a medium starts crossing over into other what other mediums do better, then it's like, well, what's the point? Uh, let's stick to what comics does better than other mediums and focus on that and celebrate that. And yeah, borrow from other mediums, of course, but but in if, if we must define things, and sometimes for the purposes of discussion, it's a good idea to define where you're coming from on something. Uh, where I'm coming from is is that the static nature of comics is is a cherished piece of the overall puzzle of what makes it all so interesting and, and, and uh, what makes me celebrate them. So introducing motion, in my opinion, is problematic. Does that make sense? I know you don't agree with me. So that does make sense. So theoretically... So let's say I've gone to the Jersey Joe's school and I've I've bought into that. The that the motion is going to throw me into a different medium or a hybrid that where where it makes it no longer the official comics. I, I've said again and again uh, that in, in the case of motion comics, that, that medium that popped up like a what a couple of years ago, I got nothing against the medium mm-hmm. itself. I think it's it's really interesting and cool and it's worth exploring. Just don't call it comics for God's sakes. Call it something else. Call it you know, uh, uh, I forget some of the names that I, I came up with. And Luis Escobar, uh, a Simpsons storyboard artist, and I talked about this. And we came up with a bunch of different options to call it. Because, like, he as an animator. Animatic. Yeah, he, yeah. As, an animator, as an animator, he said, well, it can't be called animatics because that's, like, a piece of the animator's toolkit. And it does a very specific thing. So it's just because of the fact, and here's another reason I get, I get itchy about this. Comics isn't even a really good name for the medium. It's not. It's just we're stuck with it, you know? I love the medium. I hate the name because then when I go to the family gatherings, they're like, what, you're a comics artist? What, are you a stand-up comedian? You know, no, no. Oh, you're a funny guy, huh? Tell me a joke. No, I, I'm not. I, I tell stories visually. Oh, what, you're a filmmaker? Oh, crap. You know, if we just had a really good name at the outset, then I could say, if you say I'm a filmmaker, people know what the heck you do. So when it came to this motion comics thing, it wasn't about me trying to segregate and say, hey, you go into this internment camp and we'll wait until we're not mad at you anymore to let you out. It was a situation where it's like, hey, you guys have an opportunity here to name yourselves something really distinct and then we can celebrate your art form, but just please don't call it comics because we have a hard enough time. (laughs) People say, oh, you're a graphic novelist. Oh, no, not really. You know, so anyway, I'm sorry I didn't mean to tread all over you. You you, you just tapped on an area that hasn't fully uh... healed for me. No, no, I, uh, I, I apologize for uh, misuse of my Jeet Kune Do skills. Um, <laughs> you gotta explain what that is, because I didn't know what that was when you. I touched a nerve center. No, I. I what's funny is I'm not a pra- I'm not a, I'm a practitioner of Jeet Kune Do. I was actually um, uh, every once in a while, like I'll go through a topic and, and you know, doing some research, and I, I'll think about 
how it may remind me of something that I even brought it up on a, a lean into art where I'll think of like certain things Bruce Lee said. And he's one dude of, of millions of people who have dedicated their lives to studying martial arts and coming up with interesting observations on the human condition and expressing them in an artful manner. But he happens to be a famous dude that's done that. And, and um, you know, eh, I don't mean to overemphasize his work over others, but he comes to mind anyway. And uh, Jeet Kune Do, by the way, is, is that's the, uh, the martial art that he started when, uh, you know, so he came to the U.S. and, you know, I think on his way and then as he came in, he studied many different martial arts and he started to sort of think of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, uh, in situational um, applications of different arts and their strengths and weaknesses. And he started to... Uh, formulate uh, a different system which is by and large not a system <clears throat> because it's highly individualized which reminds me of like how you're pointing out these different definitions and your definition is totally valid your perspective I is awesome and totally valid and the 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 tough thing is we end up sharing a vocabulary that gets used in different ways like I, I remember when when um, when uh, you know video games is a topic that's inspired me a lot and when it switched from on the cover of PC Gamer were, were things like uh, you know Doom uh, Quake Quake 2 um, let's see uh, uh, Dungeon Keeper and whatever like like in games that are very niche and whatnot and all of a sudden one one month it was uh, Big Deer Hunter mm. and the world changed so like there's a mass of people that are now Influ are asserting their observations and influence and uh, their definitions onto what I felt was a world I was very comfortable with those definitions. And that was frustrating. Um, but at the same time, you know, positive things came out of it too. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't really like that, that change. Um, I don't know. Um, that, that is, that's, that's a really good anecdote to kind of shake me loose out of that thing like there, there's a certain kind of pride that comes out of drawing a line in the sand and saying this is what i stand for there's like it, it takes a certain kind of chutzpah and confidence to be able to make that mm -hmm. stand right but on the other hand there's always a danger that taking that stand can just be stubbornness about what's new and i think where wisdom comes in is when God, I'm I'm getting really lame and philosophical now. This is totally four o'clock in the morning stoner conversation, but I think where wisdom comes in is being able to differentiate between: Are you taking a stand just to be proud? Or are you taking a stand because it's important? Um, it's funny. I think of the word righteous. This morning, I was talking with Ann about you know you said something in the last episode that really kind of stuck with me, uh, but not in a good way. It was like one of those things that troubled me and maybe kind of like itchy. And uh, it was when I was telling a story about some some comics event where I couldn't shut up about making observations about people's works, and you said something about like you're you're being the sheriff of comics wherever you are, and I was like, oh god, no, I don't want to be that guy, I don't want to be that guy, and, and it made me it made me, the rest of the week I was just like, oh, am I that guy? Am I that guy who thinks that he's the Pope of Chili Town? You know, to quote The Simpsons, and um, so. <laughs> So I, I said to Anne, I told the story to Anne and I told her you know what Rob said and and this is where you know like I'm really grateful to you like it's it's rare to be friends with somebody who can make an observation about you and make a little jab that is somewhat mocking somewhat endearing uh, or somewhat some comes out of a sense of endearment uh, but also makes you think a little bit harder about every the way you behave right and it pushes you in a little bit more of a thoughtful direction be more, more intentional about how you behave. And so I said to him, I was like, gosh, am, am I that guy? Am I just walking around thinking like I got the, 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 the gun belt on and I'm watching over everybody to make sure everything's right in, in Comics Town? And she said, no, I think you're just the sheriff of niceness and you just want everybody to feel good around you. And so you're always trying to... <laughs> I thought, well, that's a better way to put it. I like that. I, I don't know if that's right, but I'm subscribing to it. <laughs> that's funny. <sighs> anyway, uh, but where, where I was... Yeah, I... Good. I, I definitely uh, enjoy the impishness of, of that kind of um, <clears throat> exchange. And, uh, you know, uh, I receive and, and give it. So. 
But anyway, where, where I was going with all this is that uh, it's it's always tough to know whether or not you're making a stand for the right reasons. And uh, when it came, you know, I, I gave all my justifications for making that stand about the whole definition of comics thing. But as, as a general rule, uh, yeah, I don't think, I think overly defining things becomes very dangerous because being a slave to craft, being a slave to a, a process that's worked for somebody else, it's going to come as no surprise to anybody that I don't think that uh, that's a necessarily a very good idea. And so what we're going to talk about today, what we've got for this video episode, are some techniques we've used to break that whole process uh, to get you focused on the ideas of storytelling rather than a prescribed, well, this is how Adam Hughes does it, this is how uh, Walt Simonson does it, this is how uh, Rick Leonardi does it. Uh, I better just do it that way after all. I better get this pen, this, and I, and I gotta draw it in this kind of sequence, and I have to do it in pencils, thumbnails, inks, and, and in my experience in the classroom, I've seen students, both young and teens and adults, get really flummoxed by all of the drawing that has to happen in order to make a comic, you know? And early on in my teaching, I remember kind of like doing the whole like, welcome to the real world, kids. Uh, where they would be like, you mean you got to draw a page th upwards of three to four times in order to have it final? I'm like, yeah, that's what we do. We work hard. Welcome to hell, kids. You know, population you. This sucks, but you're going to do it, you know? <laughs> that's a sheriff of jerk town. <laughs> that's so mean. <laughs> oh, my God. Sheriff of jerk town. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that's another thing that it becomes a temptation when you're leading a classroom is to be that guy. I mean, I felt I found myself falling into that every once in a while. And and fortunately, I was able to shake myself out because I didn't like how I felt after I said those things to people, because then I'd see them kind of go, huh. You know, it's like it's like I think about uh, I posted this on path last night. Uh, I, was, I was trying to unwind and uh, popped in Metroid Other M, which is not a popular Metroid game. <laughs> And, uh, but I found that I really liked it. I was really enjoying the gameplay aspect. I love how it can, you can switch between first person and third person. It kind of harkens back to the old Super Metroid and the original Metroids. Um, not, not a fan of all the cutscenes and storytelling, but I, I was loving the gameplay aspect. And, uh, and, I, and the, the villains were pretty challenging, but not too challenging. They were just enough to where it was like, I might die once, but then the next time, I, I, by, in dying, I figured out, oh, that's the sequence of things I got to do in order to beat the guy. And then I beat the guy, I feel good, and then it's time to move on. Well, I got into this room where there's a bad guy who is impossibly fast. He's throwing a million bombs at you a second, and you basically just have to dodge, 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 dodge like a thousand times until that one second when he lifts up his head and the little red thing is there for you to shoot. And then you got to shoot that eight times until he starts staggering, and then you got to run in really fast and do this. I looked up a walkthrough because I was so frustrated. Ten times I died, mm. and finally I was like, Pugh! through the controller, I'm done. You made this too challenging, and the it's not rewarding enough for me to pretend to be a gun-armed, armored woman in a science fiction world if I have to constantly go through this, in the, plus with load times, every time I hit, like, you want to start again, hit yes, i got to wait, like, 15, 20 seconds for it to reload. Forget it. No, my time is too valuable for me to waste on that, and now this game that I was really enjoying and loving, I just, I hate it now. I'm just, God, I'm done. And I think about that in my classrooms, too, is that I don't ever want to be that boss where I'm like, it's hard, but you just got to get through it. You know, there are times where it's okay to cheat because it's about getting the idea on paper more so than going through this rigorous, systematized sequence of things in order to prove yourself as a cartoonist. Did I just say any words that added up to an idea? I hope I did. Um, yeah, I think so. It's, uh, being very much hot, like how, uh, and this is, this is the, what's funny is the, the, the meta topic I, I've been, I, I've been studying and chewing on both for, uh, some classes that I'm working on and for, you know, ongoing podcasts, possibly new podcast project, whatever. Anyway, um, it, it was, uh, it was looking at, uh, how do, how do we learn? How do we communicate? And also taking a step back and wondering, like, um, re-questioning things that are now fundamental to how I see um, communication, just to to be 
uh, more in touch and honed with the, the fundamental thoughts there as far and, and, and why I am. And uh, uh, like, why do I think that um, there's no, like all communication is participatory? Like people will talk about how there's interactive mediums and passive mediums and all that stuff. And I don't really think there are. <clears throat> so, and, and then, you know, taking a step back and, and wondering why and then running into stuff like uh, Bruce Lee and whatever. And yeah. then all of a sudden surfing a few YouTube, YouTube videos to say, you know, see like, well, why is Bo Young talking to, you know, uh, John Claude Van Damme, right there, and whatever. Anyway, mm. whatever. Uh, as far as the uh, in gaming, though, like there's this idea that gets uh, you know fairly fairly emphasized. If you wanted to design a game, you have to somehow have a, a well met balance between you know as the as the challenge goes up, your skills need to you know the game needs to be preparing you for the challenges by increasing your skill, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so let's say the game is Metroid, but then, you know what? What if the game is making your comics in, in, in your voice and the style that you want to make mm -hmm. them? Um, and all of a sudden, you know, if, if, you're, if you are introducing someone who is at this skill level to this challenge, exactly. that is not well met. And they're going to be wondering, you know, how do I proceed? Because, um, you know, really they need to be way over here before they're really ready. It's not that finite and linear progression as far as you learn A, B, and a metaphor. C, and then D. Yeah. yeah, it's a metaphor, but, but it, it roughly works. You could really floor people with, more, with difficult things to face day one that would then make them say, nah, I'm not that interested. And I'm going I'm to plug in another little chunk onto your metaphor here, is that, so too, does this work for, you know, beginning or, uh, you know, uh, whatever skill level, you know, like an earlier skill level uh, cartoonist, somebody who's just getting into this game. Uh, just like a video game, I like to go back and I'll play Me Metroid Zero Mission for the Game Boy, which is like sort of like a mm. amped up version of the original Metroid, but but God, God does have like the best like new third of story thrown out. Have you played it, Rob? I actually haven't. Oh my god! Well, I don't know how big of a Metroid fan you are. It's like the, Metroid is like the only. Vi I've solved the Super NES version, and then have uh, played a couple of the GameCube ones, but not, not, not haven't solved. Okay, yeah, like well, Metro, Super Metroid, original Metroid, Metroid Zero Mission, Metroid Fusion, Pr Prime One. I've beaten all of them. Um, I'm, I'm that's like the one video game where I'm like really like a fanboy. I get really excited whenever I and I bought I bought the GameCube just because of Metroid Primes. Like I had no interest in the system, and then they're like, "Oh, there's a Metroid game." Ah, oh, man. All right, fine. Here's my money. Uh, <laughs> but Metroid Zero Mission is sort of like a retelling of the original Metroid game with amped up graphics, new gameplay, and then like a whole new third of story tacked on, which is like just glorious. Uh, and I've beaten it probably about 10 or 20 times you know it's like my going to bed game i'll just like oh i'll play a few sure. play comfort 20 food. minutes of yeah. metroid before i fall asleep and i know how to beat the game in under two hours now because i know where everything is i know all the things i gotta do i know oh i'm coming into this room the giant worm monster is coming in but it's fun to go back and do that again right so You've got this thing marked on the on this this uh, what X Y axis challenge and skill on this 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 chart, and somebody who's been drawing comics a while is going to say, "Oh well, a challenge that is meant for somebody with a lower skill level has no use to me anymore." Uh, I would argue that just like playing a beloved old game, it certainly does because it's a way to reacquaint yourself with some things that you encountered on your process or on your on your. Uh, uh, path through this whole career thing, right? You go back and you refresh yourself and get reacquainted because you love doing it. And and also because uh, in playing the original, or Metroid uh, Zero Mission again, I'll sometimes find new things that I, oh, there was a missile tank there that I did not know was there, that I overlooked because I was so intent on getting to that goal. I want to get to the end, I want to get to the mother brain and beat her. Um, but by playing it again, even after beating her, I found new things. New, new little bits in there. So, uh, very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's sort of a, you can come up with, with uh, 
you you have found sort of a, a meta experience that's beyond the, the the default of the the challenge and skill because you've played that out and then every time you continue to play it there you're you could be getting other things out of it maybe you, you're critiquing the game or maybe you're analyzing the art or um yeah the 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 sound i mean there's there's some other aspect that you're diving into there's a into. scene in the new third act of the game where you are stripped of your armor and all you've got is a stun gun and you have to infiltrate a space pirate ship and it's really tough i don't want to say it's like impossibly tough but it's tough and when i was playing it the first time through i was like i just got to survive i just got to survive and get to the end so i can get my suit back i need my suit now when I play it, it's like, oh, here's that really neat part where they do this great setup where there's only a spotlight on Samus and everything else is kind of dark, but I can see movement up in the top. And now I can get, I can appreciate the craftsmanship that went into making this scene feel really tense and haunting. Um, little things like that. Yeah, you get like, a, like you were talking about a meta understanding of what went into this. So, gosh, I don't want to eat up this whole time just talking about the philosophical setup. I want to get into some of the tricks that we have some of the cheats that people can use. That's what the red light represents. It's it's the it's the danger zone <laughs> of uh, we, we, we might get nerdy and philosophical. <laughs> and, uh, and and don't get me talking about Metroid oh, too well. long. I'll talk about all day. Um, I could easily spend an hour critiquing the Metroid Other M game that I've been loving and hating at the same time. But uh, but yeah, as a, matter, as a matter of fact, one of the tricks, the, the cheats I've got set up for today is borrowed from uh, game assets. So, ah. anyway, who wants to go first? Want to cool. flip a coin? Oh, you go first. I've been doodling. All right, all right. Let me uh, start a new share. Uh, I can. Uh, or you just want to shut yours off, and I'll just start mine. Oh, you're doing that on another computer, though. So maybe, eh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about what we're going to do. All right, I'll share my screen, and I gotta share Photoshop and sharing. Okay, can you see this? All right. Yeah, I can. Okay, there cool. it is. So, what do I got here? Uh, one of the this is trick one or cheat one, and this is a blocking and moment choice exercise. Do if I explain before what what I mean by blocking when I talk about it. Uh. Give give us a quick overview. Blocking is a term I borrowed from theater, where it's where you put all the elements on the stage. In theater, you're basically dealing with one panel, right? And uh, everything has to move around within that panel in a way that everybody in this big, wide audience can see. And there's there's certain like you know rules of thumb, like don't turn your back to the audience unless you're doing it for effect and and things like that. So you got to think really hard about where you're placing your elements when you're telling the story. Theater has a whole range of really interesting limitations that I'm only partially familiar with just because when I was in high school, I did some theater. Um, but uh, but anyway, I, I remember as I was learning it, I was like, wow, this is really a lot like what you do in comics. So anyway, when I talk about blocking, I talk about where you're placing your elements in the shot, but also moment choice and also panel size. Uh, one of the things that in one of my classes I found students were really frustrated with was this whole idea of iterating your thumbnails. Um, I had the students draw the same scene three different ways, and they were like, what, really? And I'm like, yeah, it's important that you understand that there's multiple ways to look at the same thing. And so I came up with this exercise to sort of uh, both assuage their whining, but also to um, create a really quick and easy way to sort of um, troubleshoot a, uh, a sequence. So you're only thumbnailing things once. And I did this digitally, but the way I would recommend, this also works for people who work analog uh, on paper because what I would recommend you do is, uh, here's what I did, let me pull up these different assets. So all of these assets are on their own layer. So here's like a, let me hide some of these things. So yeah, we've got like a doorway in an apartment, a couch, and we've got a picture on the wall, right? And then here's one of our mm. principal characters, this angry guy. And then here's the guy he's yelling at. And then this looks a little outdated now, but a telephone on a coffee table kind of thing or end table. And then a house plant. So the first thing I thought of was, okay, what would be all the elements that we would find in this scene? It's two guys in an apartment arguing over something. Okay, where is it taking place? Living room. What things do I find in the living room? And I draw all of these things individually, and if I was doing this on paper, they would each be on their own piece of paper. And then I would cut them out. Each piece would get cut out into its own. And I would even 
Uh, on the opposite side of uh, the paper that I've cut out, I would redraw the character. So in this case, like uh, I'm going to copy this guy, and I'm going to make a new document. I'm going to paste him in, and then I'm going to reverse it. Image adjustments. Uh, wait a minute. How do you flip it? No, oh, image rotation. There we go. Uh, then I'll yep. flip it, and then I'll drop the guy back in on another layer. So there's like, you know, so I would have him drawn on both in both directions in case I want to change directions. So I'll put angry guy two. <laughs> and then what I do, cool. and this is again, if I'm working on paper, I throw a piece of tracing paper over top, and uh, I'm digitally mimicking this by just putting a low opacity sheet of white, a layer of white. And on that piece of tracing paper, I will draw different panels. Whoops. And I will draw them, you know, a narrow vertical panel, a narrow horizontal panel, right? Or a square panel, or even like an effects panel where it's, you know, like more of like a, in an angle with an, some kind of crazy jaggedy border. And, in, and then I'll, after I throw down these different panels, I'm going to try to arrange my elements within this panel and see what I can fit and how the moment feels different when I arrange the elements differently. So if I put angry guy here like this and defensive guy here and the telephone here, okay, how does that moment feel as opposed to if I do it like this? Now we've got the narrow panel. I'll put defensive guy over here, angry guy over here. Maybe can't even fit in the telephone anymore, right? Mm. So when we look at this scene, the tension is there, but there's a big distance between them, right? So that feels differently than if I were to say, bring it in like this. Now it's like they're more on top of each other, and I can even, since I'm doing this digitally, I can have them actually be more face-to-face -face by stretching it like that. Now the, the, the tension is very, very real, and I can emphasize that uh, tension by blocking in more visual elements to make this feel very claustrophobic, right? So, yeah, every element you add, it gets way more... Um, yeah, it's like it's like being in like like anybody who's ever done Christmas shopping where you're at the mall and it's really really crowded and everybody gets mad, right? Uh, why are you getting mad? Because you're in this you're getting jostled around by all these different people and elements and things, and it's not calm, it's not tranquil. So then we can go and take another size panel, and this one feels a little bit more neutral because it's a square panel. We have more room for all the characters and elements. We can even start dropping some of the physical elements. Whoops, leave angry guy in there. Right, We can get rid of some of this stuff in the background and see how that changes the way the tension feels. Do we need the background? And so this is a way where we can just draw everything once or maybe twice if we draw the reversal on each side. Um, and we can play around like with color forms, if anybody remembers what color forms are. Uh, play around with the way the scene feels in different types of panels and different compositions without having to redraw. And I can say that I remember doing this in one class where, man, there was one kid who was seriously really uptight about redrawing over and over again because they're one of those kids who spends a lot of time with technical precision and feels like even their sketches have to look really, really presentable. G getting them to draw sloppily mm -hmm. was very difficult. This was like a breath of fresh air for them because it's like, oh, so I only have to draw them once and I can spend all that time doing all that technical precision that I can't let go of, even though Jersey tells me not uh, just to draw sloppily. But I still get to do that kind of heuristic figuring things out and moving things around in order to uh, get a sense of uh, what, what the possibilities are for this shot. And then once I've got this locked the way I want it, I can take a picture of it, take a screen cap of it, save a JPEG of it, and now I've got the thumbnail to go to final with. And I only had to do one round of drawings with that, right? So somebody who's a real big nut about craft is going to say, oh, but you're cheating because you do need to draw more and more. You have to draw thousands of times in order to get good. Yes, indeed you do. But if you're stuck on a, on a moment, this is a quick way to get at how to try out some different ways to make it feel. Uh, or if drawing is still really difficult for you and 
you know, one of the things that Rob and I talk about a lot is like, just get in there and make some comics. If you're finding that I'm not very good at drawing ducks or I'm not very good at drawing phones, I'm not really good at drawing plants. Well, then just do what you can with it and rearrange these things. And, and here's the, where we could talk also about that Wally Wood adage of if in doubt, block it out. Right. It's like, oh, I'm no good at drawing feet. Well, right. Hello. Now it's still a guy, two guys fighting and I've covered up the part that uh, I'm not very good at and nobody will ever call you out on that. Unless, of course, it's like I'm no good at drawing faces and then you go like that. Right? <laughs> That's not going to work. I mean, there's some things that are going to be necessary to the part of the story, but... Um, I mean, or you could. I mean, one way to respond to the challenge is just sort of draw, draw a, you know, time to draw a comic about a duck, a plant, and a phone <laughs> that then you're forced to draw, you know, duck, plants, and phones all day. Yeah. Until uh, until you find something, you know, you know how, you, how are you going to deal with that? Now... I was wondering, um, <clears throat> so this is sort of a, an adaptation of that you, you may want to take advantage of for a lot of different reasons. If you, you know, like you mentioned, the, the, you know, some people who like to draw extra precise at every single stage, which would make the whole process take a lot longer. Um, do you think, let's see, the temptation to come up to, to use this sort of, cheat and obviously it's you know it's a i have a hard time even using the word cheat because you should do whatever you want uh, and it works so it's not cheating but let's say um uh, someone has that kind of i don't know this kind of is tempting but i'm just not that comfortable with it i have no need to try this cheat so i'm just going to keep taking an eternity to finish my pages um like i have a what if for that, but I'm curious what what you would do with that. Somebody said, like, oh, I'm just, I'm not comfortable with uh, having all of my process pieces be like cut out loose things. Uh, yeah, it's like, well, I have to learn something to even take advantage of this cheat. I can, it's kind of cool, but not cool enough where I'm like, ah, I'm just going to keep to this other thing I'm more familiar with, like, kind of on the fence, but not quite adopting it. Mm -hmm. Right? What what would you do? Um, uh, God, it, it, there's, there's a lot of conditions in there that would have to be like, that I would have to be responding to. Like one is, is this a situation where I'm noticing that the person is just not blocking their shots very well? Uh, like for instance, let's say, okay, here, here's an example of like a poorly blocked shot. Let me get rid of all the elements here. Um, oops. And... It's just panel after panel of shots like this, to which I say, where are these people? How do these moments feel distinct from one another? It's just two people. It's like it's like a Sesame Street shot of Ernie and Bert sitting, or, or Charlie Brown and Linus sitting on the brick wall. Um, there's not a lot that you're doing with the art to really communicate a, a sense of location or uh, a sense of emotion, I would say to them. And, and, and if it's something where you're reluctant to try that through iterations of thumbnailing, like if I say to them, like, well, re-thumb the scene, but do it from, like, every panel you have to use a different point of view. And if they were like, oh, that's more drawing, uh, then I would say, well, then try this. This is less drawing. Um, but if, the, if they're comfortable doing lots, being slow in, in doing lots of iterations of thumbnails, um, then I would say, then fine. You're just going to have to live with pumping out material slow. The other thing I would throw in as well is if, if uh, doing this kind of sloppy drawing is problematic for you, what I would recommend then, and this worked for one particular student I'm thinking of, um, break it down into this. Uh, oh, come on. I want to make a new layer. Right. On, uh, there was one student I'm thinking of in particular started doing all their thumbs on post-it notes with this kind of thing. And they explored mm -hmm. multiple shots that way where, you know, they were less afraid to try the dramatic down shot because they were working in stick figures. Right. And then when they got to like shots where they like, oh, I know what I'm going to do here. This guy's going to look up and he's going to be going, ah. And they would sketch it out a little bit more detailed there. But for the most part, they stuck with very, very, and they would just go like, trees, right? 
uh, sidewalk. They would be work super, super loose, like loose to the point of like anybody looking at it would not be able to comprehend what's actually on that page. They, the artists were the only ones. And so in that case, I would say, okay, well, if, if iterating is the problem and drawing and you're really like so slavishly trying to make every sketch look good, go so far over to the other end of the spectrum that you're just working in really crude shapes on little tiny post-its. Um, and that should break you free of that whole having to create multiple versions of a thumbnail. What was going to be your answer to that, Rob, is what I'm curious about. Well, it's, uh, I like your answer a lot better, but it, it's, uh, which you remind me of, uh, I mean, there, there's ways to cater your, let's see, to cater your, your approach and your lesson to end up landing on a, um, a, a, a new perspective on the problem to, to find a, then then to decide well how will you end up dealing with it and so for me the new perspective was about uh, well deadlines are one way to do it mm -hmm. um, and I, and in some ways it's sort of a um, you know this is probably not the right way I literally came up with this as we were talking but like let's say what if you um, everyone who signs up for a class buys into the idea that the final test can be any day. It could be the first day. <laughs> and the final test is to do um, a comic page based on the thing you say on that day, right? And But it has to be finished before you leave class, and you have X amount of time. Mm. Yeah, pretty... And uh, so what you can do then is be preparing... What, what are different ways to get a comic page finished? And all of a sudden, one day, just bam, drop the test. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'd be, well whatever you'd have to do to work it out and then so people could come up with new strategies that day to to figure out a way to finish the page but um setting an egg timer it'd be setting, a way to buy into the yeah setting an egg timer Sorry. right um this would be a good opportunity for me to point at some of the lean into art classes that we've got for sale right now um one of them is headline mashup which is a I, i've got two workshops on there that are games essentially they're creative Mm -hmm. uh, creative storytelling games to get you back to into that creative zone and and to reassure you that you have the the voice inside of you to tell interesting stories. You just uh, apparently, uh, if you're the kind of person where you sit there and look at the blank page going like, I don't know what to do today. Um, th these are two games to play to get you real, uh, get some material done and reassure you that you can do stuff when you force yourself to. And both games kind of require you to set a timer. Uh, you know, you've got two hours to do this thing, and that's it. That's all you get. Um, so, yeah, setting setting nice. an arbitrary deadline. I mean, I know that's tough for a lot of people to do. Those classes are, by the way, uh, headlines, headline mashup and sequences and consequences. Yep. Yep. Correct. Headline mashup takes uh, is a exercise where you take a bunch of random headlines and a ran bunch of random objects and mash them together to turn it into a story. And the workshop goes through the entire process of like. Here's the things that you should be thinking about when you do it. Sequences and Consequences is this really cool game where you take a bunch of index cards and I tell a story that you are going to sloppily draw on these index cards and then you, there's a twist at the end of the game where you do something different with the cards in order to figure out uh, some interesting new insights into your voice as a storyteller. Um, and both of them depend on this idea of not being precious about this, about just doodling and, and go, entering in the spirit of play kind of thing, which is so, so important to us. But... Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's tough for people to set themselves up uh, an arbitrary timeline, a deadline on something. It's like when I think of the in January when I did the Boulder and Fleet mini comic, that came down to me sitting down and uh, um, saying, "You get, you know, hour and a half, two hours to finish each page. That's all you get. So get it done. You know, set the timer and go." And I forced myself to adhere to that, and I had a finished thing because of that. So. Yeah, I think I think it can work, but you got you have to be you have to have the same kind of um, I don't know. Is it the same as like an exercise regimen? I mean, that's that same idea, right? Like twenty minutes every day. I'm going to do this. It is. I mean, it's um, I mean, part of it. It's it's the you can cheat on the cheat, but there's there's a point where you end up you know picking what 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 do you care to be working on, right? So do you want to finish your story? Do you want to work on um, your your blocking skills? Do you want to work on your line technique? What what is the thing you're trying to get out of this project? And then that sort of will end up, I think, being what you end up drawing your own boundary as far as as cheating. Mm -hmm. 
And um, yeah, <laughs> Bert and Ernie. Yeah, I'm just doing um, while talk. Sorry. Yeah. So it, it's uh, very interesting, and and because uh, like this, you know, looking at looking at it as as uh, cheating, it just looks like a good adaptation. Like the this the exercise that you have here, separate assets, being able to block things out, like um, any tool that would let you. Um, interact with uh, separate objects that are visual would help for this. Like you could do this in Keynote, PowerPoint, mm -hmm. um, Photoshop, Fireworks, um, um, Flash, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Piece of cake to, you know, work with the library there. And so it's whatever, you know, tool you're used to, chances are there's something you're familiar with where you could, you know, drill in and uh, take advantage of this one. Yeah, and, and I just wanted and, uh, to overemphasize that analog aspect to it, too, because, yeah, of course we can do this in Photoshop super easy, but the whole sketching on paper part is where people say, well, gosh, it's not the same uh, as when you're working on paper because, you know, it's it's draw a line or erase a line. That's the two options you got, or crumple the paper and throw it over your shoulder. Well, that's not necessarily so with this simple thing where you draw your assets first and then just cut them out. And the whole idea is to try to get you to draw sloppily because, yeah, you've got a lot of steps to this. you got to cut it out, and then you got to get your tracing paper, draw your panels and everything. But that allows you to do a lot of this mixing and matching after the fact, even if it's just on paper. So it works for analog or digital that concludes this cheat for this round uh i want to kick it back over to you rob and see what you've got all right well speaking of analog or digital uh do 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 sharing my desktop metroid we're, we're back to metroid no okay <laughs> actually no um let's see here so I like to, uh, we've mentioned a few different times in the past about, um, uh, you know, different leaning to our cast, uh, and when Art Geek Zoo comes up, um, <clears throat> roughly every, I, I don't even know what it is, like 20 episodes or so, I, I end up switching techniques. And it's even more aggressive than that. I mean, I've, I've produced episodes of Art Geek Zoo exclusively in, like, all sorts of different tools. I mean, they all end up electronic at some point. But um, uh, having a deadline is a fantastic way to, to say, well, how am I going to get there? And then if you're thinking, about, like for me, I would think, well, I'm stuck. I need to find a different, force myself into a new habit to, to get better at coloring. Okay, I'm going to set aside what I'm familiar with over and over <laughs> until uh, I get a better appreciation on that. Um, so... Jump ahead, to, you know, up to um, a 24-hour comic day this year, and here I, you know, here here is an art challenge with a you know short deadline that we've actually talked about that as well, and uh, this is what page 12 from uh, from that comic, and um, let's see here if I can, um, I mean, I could just shut off the layers, but I want to show you the physical um, physical piece of paper that I've been using here. Um, so I have a whole stat. These are all the sketches from from 24 Hour Comic Day. That's actually from page one okay. of the comic, and obviously that is rather uh, unrendered. Um, yeah. So I'm actually instead of sharing this on my desktop, I'm um, I can make the video bigger for just a second. throwing it in the camera there for those of you that are listening and can benefit from neither. At least <laughs> you know. Uh, oh wow! Look at Jersey with zooming in. Um, so here is uh, the page that we're currently on, and uh, so I've blocked it in. I figured out the the you know the, the panel layout, which oops, um, the panel layout is not very dynamic and whatnot, but you know, tight deadline and and all that kind of stuff. It it um, uh, I needed to know who was going to be where in what order, saying the the words that I'd uh, written mm -hmm. out, um, and what else. Do, do, do. Uh, but you'll see, like, so there's 24 of these. And uh, so I've got these cards, which are um, an 8 and a half, 11 piece of, um, uh, oh gosh, card stock that I've, uh, I've cut into to fours. So well, they're mini comic size. It's mini comic size. Of, yeah. And I also find, 
Exactly. It's very much like that. I also find this an interesting form factor that, that um, you know, in, you know, you can go portrait or landscape. Mm -hmm. um, it's handy to do, you know, quick sketches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it's small. Like there, there's a bunch of hacks going on and, and cheats going on here at once. So instead of one cheat, I am, um, I pushed you in the cheat lake. <laughs> and now we're both, and then I jumped in and uh, unprepared to swim and we're all trying to swim there and, and uh, catching yeah. up. And, and, and uh, I, I even threw an anchor that had the word metaphor <laughs> written on it right after us. <laughs> Was that um, a nested metaphor? So <laughs> it is, yeah. Watch out. Um, the uh, okay. So small piece of paper, uh, something that's readily available, something that I can um, that I can have uh, portable wherever I go. I want to be able to enact a, the the complete process of making comics. And uh, why? Because. Well, maybe I'm on, I'm at a client site on a lunch break, or maybe um, let's see, I'm uh, uh, it, baby's taking a nap, and I, I'm you know trying to squeeze in some work, but I'm not going all the way to my office because I might not hear or not, that kind of stuff. All of these different things to be able to work wherever, and um, those are my kind of reasons. Like I just want to be able to you know do this and not be locked up in one spot. True, my office is my primary place where I'm the most productive, but it's this constant interest I have to not be locked the, to that, where I could only produce there. So portability, small. The other reason why I'm playing with small, I, I should have brought some larger sketches too, is um, it's less space to fill. Like this takes less time to draw here than it would on a, you know, um, eleven by seventeen. This is um, and obviously this is why I was talking about the post-it notes earlier. Is that by working that small, you don't have the luxury of being a uh, brilliant illustrator, right? It's it's getting down to just simple moment choices and getting the ideas put down there quickly, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So and even when I'm you know working with characters that you can recognize, you know what they are who they are and what they're doing and stuff, it, um, uh, it's enough detail where I trust myself that I can take that and accomplish the next step with this. And that's the only test is like, is this worth it? It's, did it get in my way or did it help me? And, uh, there's that Bruce Lee philosophy getting in there, right? <laughs> Be yep. Well, because this somebody is, uh... who's a slave to craft or to a traditional process would throw in on that, that, well, well who are you to pick and choose what is right for you? Uh, this is the way the masters did it, and that's why they're masters. So don't, don't be this finicky kid who doesn't want to eat his beets. Vote Pink Floyd. <laughs> Uh, Pink Floyd. Um, <laughs> I had to watch the wall in psychology wall. class. Laugh riot. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, artists having tough times and stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Whoop. Clo I'm shrinking so, the wrong window here. Oh wait. What? Oh, stuff is flying all over. All right. I was gonna. Pull, um, what was pull up I? Your share window again. Pull up the other window. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. I'll try to do. Let's switch. Um. So, yeah, this is a uh, a more a finished page along that process. I'm actually uh, using uh, Manga Studio here. Uh, that was another thing. So, speaking of um, jumping into Lake Challenge or whatever I called it, uh, yeah, 24-hour comic day. I hadn't finished. Um, I've never even finished one page in Manga Studio, and I decided to make that what I. Did the comic in? It's not. I'm not saying this like I'm bragging. Watch me go. I'm dangerous comic man, and uh, no. you know, like Super Dave of <laughs> Super comics. Dave. Um, this is you doing the whole. Is it challenging? Is it probably a bad idea? Let's go for it. Oh yeah. And I, uh, I think I mentioned this on the recent Polytechnic cast, but um, part of my challenge to myself was to not 
was to make it hard enough where I had to really deal with every single page based on, you know, I want to have a good learning experience, but I also wanted to have something um, that I cared about more than in the prior 24-hour comic day. Anyway, and we've talked about that before, but um, so let's see. So all these cheats needed to add up to something I still cared about. Um, so very likely, like, these are glimpses into the process I'll be using for the next um, chapter of Art Geek Zoo, um, although it'll be in color and stuff. It's not just going to be um, uncolored, sort of like my, my off-season stuff here. Um, let's see. So, right, poking around Manga Studio. Um, this is the story editor, and um, here we go. I just uh, finished uh, page 11. Uh, actually, I didn't finish the uh, word balloons yet. But um, you could look at Manga Studio itself. Like, it's a cheat. It's a dedicated, like, all about making comics app application where, like, you can, you can um, let's see. So I want to go into um, character mode. And, uh, like, that, that word balloon, like, this is, this is based on uh, affordances and tools that are built into Manga Studio where I'm not physically drawing that shape on my own. It is helping me do it. Like, uh, so if, if we do a new word balloon for this, and uh, let's see if I go into text, and I go into dialogue balloon settings, and I go into select balloon for material. So I actually have some preferences I saved as my you know, preferred balloon style. And I just go match text, and all of a sudden it's the right size, right? Wow. And, I, and I'm starting to come up the learning curve of Manga Studio. I'm not a master of it, whatever. But, like, I am trying it out because it's rewarding me for trying to find out these things. And, it's you know, it, it's passing the test of uh, is it helping me or, or hurting me? And it's like, it's helping me. So let's keep going. Um, let's see. Then I'm of liking course, the uh, lines you're getting out of Manga Studio, like in panel two there. On like the 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 contours on the outline of the 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 sweater there, and then plus the burst lines, those look nice. Oh, thank you. Um, that's part of my uh, uh, one of the things I want to get better at and uh, make sure I'm living up to this next season is is better line value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Brandon Dayton's class <laughs> for lead to art, yeah. foundations of dynamic line work. Yeah, leave it to uh, thirty classes in thirty days to basically. Um, have helped me redefine how I'm trying to approach it. Yeah. <laughs> something I've already been doing for a few years, you know, pretty funny, um, but way worth it. Uh, but you notice like, I mean, this stuff is all edit editable in context based on what's important to comics. It's not about, Hey, it's a shape and it's all generic shapes. Yeah. And this is, you know, illustrator. That's just about these rudimentary things with a few refinements on top, like gradients and whatever. Um, it's no, it, this thing, whole thing is all about comics, full of uh, cheats. Um, and so, all right, so I go from this, you know, uh, let's see, I lost this page, but, you know, I go from one of these. Um, so here I am with a, with a whole stack of these little um, sketch cards. I, I got them into Manga Studio by taking pictures with my, um, my smartphone. Oh, wow. Didn't even use a scanner. Didn't even use a scanner. While I'm sitting on, on at at the uh, you know Minnesota Center for Book Arts, you know, part of my rules, I want to be able to finish this wherever I'm at, and you know you, and have some flexibility. It's not like when I'm in one situation, I have to have the specific bat suit. You know, like if I don't have the underwater <laughs> bat suit, I'm hosed if I'm underwater, right? <laughs> right. Um, there's no adaptation. No, I've got to be adaptable too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, no scanner. Um. So uh, even if you want to work digital, you can work partly analog and digital and save yourself some time if you're just going to snap a picture mm -hmm. and, you know, keep rolling with uh, whether you sketched out the whole darn page or you just really nailed a pose on a character, mm -hmm. boop, throw it in there and draw over it Yep. Um, via, you know, sending yourself the picture so you got it on your laptop. Uh, so... That's a lot of cheating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do like this idea, too, of um, 
how when you showed that pile of cards, you had the old binder clip, the old uh, hipster PDA binder clip on this pile of cards. Um, this is another thing that I get asked by students and parents is, what's the right sketchbook for my kid? Uh, what's the right pens? What's the right, uh, you know, wh where should they be journaling their ideas? And I'm like, in anything, in anything that they like to write in, you know, it's like whether it's a, uh, do I have it here? No, I don't. Uh, boy, it should, I should have one. I've been liking these little cheapy, um, this was like a buck. Yep. Um, and, and it's sort of a nice companion for um, these quarter page sketch cards. Yep. And um, they can fit in like a or little. Or, of course. Uh, hmm. Oh, yeah. Note you know, cards. Actual note cards. But yeah, those little tiny, uh, uh, what is that? What is that called? Clipboard. Uh, they fit in most little whatever rucksack you're using to get around, right? Um, yep. And I've talked about this before. It's like having a kit. For every location, I think we talked about this in the uh, thirty classes in thirty days keynote. We did yeah, it was the first. Um, it was the it was the keynote. Yeah. Moleskin, moleskine. Right, right. So some so some anyway, people think you got to get one like the fancy moleskine uh, with the uh, the the rubber band on it and everything, and like oh you got to have like a day planner one, you got to have a sketch one. And, Oh, geez, anything, anything. Like, uh, one sketchbook I filled that I actually wound up filling, or it wasn't even a sketchbook, it was a notebook, but it was a Transformers animated notebook. And God, if I didn't love that notebook, because it was covered with artwork of the characters from the show that I loved so much. So it was it was a delight to carry it around with me. Every time I opened up, I was like, oh, there's Optimus Prime, and I turned the page, and there's an Autobot symbol on there, fun! And I just doodled the, the, the heck out of that. And a lot of the stuff was throwaway ideas. I should just throw away the notebook, but I'm not gonna, because it's it's just a beloved little item in my class. So I didn't have to spend 40 bucks on this thing and I didn't have to look for the proper one. Although, I mean, there's always like tooth, you know, it's like if you like sketching on something with that has a smoother finish, then yeah, I get like a smoother cardstock or whatever. That's the thing you should be looking at, not whether it's bound this way or if it's that size, like play around with different things like that. And my, my gut says, uh, I'm usually happier when I'm drawing small because it forces me to work loose too. And then to have a, a kit in every location where you're going to be. So like, you know, after I think I told the story on the keynote that we did, um, my car broke down just before 30 classes in 30 days. Right. Um, tire fell off while I was driving and it, it took over three hours for the wrecker to come get me and then take me home. And it was, and, and, and I could have walked home in that time, but I couldn't abandon my car. And, uh, it just so happened that it happened on a morning when I was taking my wife to work and I thought, well, it's 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 a ten minute drive round trip. I don't need to take anything with me. So I I was stuck with nothing to do in a car for three hours, and I was like, oh, I should have brought a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. So now it's like there's like a little notebook of some sort in every place where I could possibly be at any given time, just to prevent that from ever happening again. Um, yep. Anyway, yeah. So I think that that's another thing to another takeaway from what you've shown us here. Uh, do we have time to do one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay, I've got one. And this one is like a, a fast one. Uh, do you shut off your share and then I'll turn on? Oh, I should stop sharing. I, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, do, do, do. There we go. Okay, share my screen. Let's go to my Photoshop again. Okay. So now, another thing that I find students have a hard time with when in in terms of this whole uh thumbnailing and moment choices so the first the first one the first cheat that i th threw out was a way to troubleshoot moment choices and blocking well now i want to talk about line and color cues uh another thing that i've done i've, I've practiced this with students and they've seemed to have had a good time of it is i'll give them a little tiny grid of panels and so the choice has been removed to even think about like size relationships of the panels in the storytelling. Now we're just focusing on pure moment choice, but I also make sure that these are small. These are like maybe two inches by two inches. And then I give them a box of crayons and I say, you have to tell the story with crayons. Oh no, Mr. Jones, we can't tell the story with crayons because you can't get any detail out of them. You can't even write words. Don't even write words. What you're going to do is you're going to draw everybody in a scribble and that and so it, this isn't even about drawing people. It's like you got to think about what's the emotional context and what's the tonal context of this scene. So we're gonna have two characters talking, um, and I'll use this as an example I've gone to again and again is boy and a girl sitting on a bench. 
and they're having that that awkward uh, young love conversation of what kind of boys do you like? I don't know. What kind of girls do you like? Tee hee. Right? What are all the things that are worth looking at? But also, how do these characters feel when they're saying this? And can you come up with a line in a color that represents their emotional state? So I'm going like this girl is a little uneasy and the boy is a little bit more confident as they have their conversation and then uh, suddenly the girl brightens up during the conversation. See, I don't, I don't even have, again, this is working in crayon, so I don't even have room to put in the dialogue, but I'm thinking about what are the emotional cues, what are the emotional high points and low points, and suddenly the girl feels emboldened and she says something that, like, oh, you mean this? And but the boy wasn't expecting this, and this uh, catches him off guard, and so suddenly he's feeling a little bit on the defensive. Oh, wrong color. I want to get up into this blue. And he's like, "What?" And maybe even like a little bit more of a yellowish blue. Like that I could throw on top. And she still doesn't understand, so she's she's warming up to the guy. And she's saying, like, oh, I think I'm starting to like you even more. And I'm going to choose a different brush because I want to get a nice, round, curvy feeling to this. And now the boy's feeling really awkward. And he's thinking, oh, I don't know. I guess so. Maybe even a little bit. And then she's now she's feeling, like, chipper. Let's go. Let's go for a walk together because I'm having a wonderful time on this date. And now the boy is feeling somewhere in between that blue and green range. I guess. Uh, so the idea is, and actually I don't like that smooth shape. I'm going to put a little bit of edginess to it. So what this is about is it's about breaking down the characters into pure color, line, and emotion. And before, if I, when I do this as an exercise, I say, okay, well, let's define what the scene is about. And I said it was like the awkward, we'll get different pen that's not so big. Awkward, young, love. And then I just did word associations as I, as I was sussing out the scene. Like, well, awkwardness, well, what kind of awkwardness would there be? Well, there's the awkwardness of the first encounter, and then... The awkwardness of a misunderstanding. She feels this. She she feels this purple, and she's feeling she's starting to smooth out a little bit. She's starting to warm up to the idea. He's getting a little bit more defensive. I'm also working in body language as well as line language and color language. Now she's warming up even more, and she's filling up more of the shot. See, by just breaking this into a, a simple color exploration, I thought, well, as she warms to him, she would be more expansive. She would expand. Uh, and so I instinctively put in more red and rounded it out. Well, now when I get down to drawing this as a sequence, that was a clue to me to maybe say she should fill in this much of the shot. And now look at, by just doing this color thing, right? Yeah, I cool. automatically got a cue just by just drawing wiggly shapes and lines. And what, did what? Um, did the guy eat like a garlic sandwich or something? <laughs> I mean, well, I was thinking like he wants it to go well, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too close. Well, this this color cue thing too also gives you a sense of if you do a squint test on this, we could say like let's say you're working with a limited color palette and you're working with spot color type of coloring, or let's say you color this with more natural colors, but this particular shot. Red predominates the shot. So let's throw a wash of red over top of this, like a low opacity wash of red to give it a warmer feeling because we want the readers to identify with the way she's feeling right now. But maybe that wash of red will just be a gradient that only goes to this point so that we still feel like there's a coolness on this guy as he's feeling, you know, detached and apart from that moment, right? So... Sure. It's a it's a it's a quick way into exploring what the emotional context is of the scene without having to go through all that rigmarole of drawing everything right. And it might give you 
some new insights into how to frame up these shots because all you're working with is just a couple of color shapes, right? So like if going back to the earlier versions, it was just two color swatches on the on in the panels, but through my own intuition, I was developing a sense of body language and moment choice and placement. Although when we looked at this panel originally, uh, there was no indication necessarily that I was going to do an over-the-shoulder headshot with her filling up most of the shot, framing him as he's looking smaller and less powerful. It's just something that I got a clue in from just doing this quick scribbling with crayons on a piece of paper. So again, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of artificial limitations on there to force us to only deal with one aspect. And when we're so focused on drawing well or drawing accurately or getting our perspective right, we can ignore some of these really key insights into or key storytelling tools that we have. Uh, and, and you know, this this supports my thesis of how uh, cartooning is not just about drawing; it's primarily about storytelling and using image to convey story and you don't have to draw well to do that if you understand these kind of principles then it doesn't matter how well you draw it matters how well you combine these principles into c communicating an idea to uh, an audience and i don't know if you have anything to say about that uh you, oh i think you should bring it back on the screen so. but other than right, uh pull it back up yeah um so would you think that I mean, let's see. I, I'm trying to not just phrase this as some uh, baloney artificial question because I, I, I do mean to telegraph the impression I got here too. Where it, it seems like you're that that you've isolated a concern and you're now designing for emotion, mm -hmm. right? You you flattened out time. You flattened out concerns as far as um, uh, you know rendering and accuracy and whatever. But it, it's just like color and emotion. Now. If, let's say, um, well, let's see, I know a lot of times, um, well, with any medium that I've, that I've started to pursue as, as, a, as an art form that I, I want to develop my own voice in, I think sometimes I know I, I may be in, overly inspired and maybe sometimes emulating the things I've seen before, mm -hmm. right? And as you should. An exercise like this seems really interesting in how it could just pull me way the heck away from these other symbols and previously uh, familiar and comfortable ideas into this uh, uh, getting closer to my own idea, my own perspective, right? Uh, right. Instead of trying to, you know, uh, look at it on the surface level, like, well, yeah, I'm staging the scene just like um, whatever, the... Uh, early 90s ghostwriter because I, I really love the the intensity and the scribbliness and so all my art is all tied up with that whereas uh, where this is just I'm caring about emotion so do you think that doing that is is this like one way to not just um, I don't know get through designing a page but it's almost like a way to you know figure out like what you care about more as a storyteller yeah. Yeah, because it's removing it's removing a whole fleet of of things that could get in the way of expressing your voice. Uh, the idea is that you want to find out what you have to say as a storyteller. Um, emulation is so important to learning something. Like when you look at say like a '90s Ghostwriter, and he had that kick butt looking motorcycle when they upgraded the motorcycle with the big metal plate on the front and everything. Oh yeah, uh, Mark Texiera, I think was drawing that for a while. Um, Super, super dynamic, and then, but there was also like a grittiness to his line that he had. Like he had like this kind of sloppiness to his shading lines, which made everything look. Yeah, it was a stereotypical thing in the '90s, but I, I loved it. Uh, Actually, I still. Texera like did it differently than most of the other guys, though. I mean, his stuff wasn't. It was. It wasn't like that slick, polished. Everybody's like glistening all the time. It looked like everybody was covered in dust. No, it was gritty. It was yeah. And uh, you gritty. could spend hours picking that apart and trying to emulate it in your work, before you figure out that oh. That's not what my voice is as a, as a storyteller at all. And maybe I've grabbed Bruce Lee style three or four things from him that are useful to me, but to just wholesale pull in the guy's style and play with it for a while is it can be a time consuming way to get at this thing. Uh, when what what's really making Ghost Rider tick is Mark Texera having this kind of like simple thing going what I've done here on the screen, this simple thing going on in his mind that he's expressing through all the skills he's acquired throughout his entire life. 
he knows that this moment feels this way and this is an instinctive thing for him now because he's gone through all this stuff all this procedural stuff right he's drawn enough pages that this is ingrained into who he is so when the writer says hey he feels really terrified in the scene he knows where to put your eye to make you feel terrified and uh you can get at where maybe your eye is going. Like, okay, let's go back to something that got passed around Tumblr a while back. Um, th did you see that quote from Ira Glass about taste? Probably. Um, it, 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 somebody wrote it out on like a blog post, and it got Just it got like a billion notes on Tumblr. And Ira Glass was talking about how when you're when you're learning art of any kind and you suck at it at first, and you know you suck at it. The reason you know you suck at it is because you have an exquisite sense of taste. You know what's good. You can point at what's good. Maybe you can't even articulate what's good, but you know it. You have a sense of it. And you know you're not coming, you're not achieving that bar. You're coming in short on that. Um, and he said that the only way to get at to where your stuff meets your taste is to just work really hard for a long time and then think about it really hard and eventually you'll get up to that point where your skill level matches your exquisite sense of taste. Building on that idea, I would back up and say, well, because you have that sense of taste, let's simplify, let's take out all that skill stuff and let's just focus on just throwing some sloppy lines down to see if we can infer what that sense of taste is and bring in your own voice as a storyteller very early on and then maybe make it easier for you to identify which tools or which styles or which uh, usage use cases by, uh, as, as expressed by other artists are useful to you in achieving what you want to tell in a story. But it, the headline would be is that this is, this is for the person who says, I'm having trouble thumbnailing the scene. The scene is supposed to be about jealousy and it feels like it's coming in flat. Okay, throw away all that drawing stuff break out a sheet of paper, don't even panel it. Just put out a grid and let's just start using some crayons and color in some sloppy shapes that, that express how the moment feels. We're getting inside the character's heads, we're, we're living in the characters for a little while, and we're trying to express that in, is immediately and as viscerally as possible without getting all of this artistic skill stuff in our way, without that distraction in our way. Yeah, all too easy to get distracted. That is a, yeah, I, I really dig this exercise. Oh, cool. Um, Kids liked it, uh, although at first they thought that they had me over a barrel. They thought that I was like, uh, like, oh, teacher doesn't want to work today, so he's giving us a dumb assignment. And, uh, and then when I... <laughs> this is a Jersey Joe's patented fool's errand. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I walked around the room and go. said, okay, well, look at what you did here, look at what you did here, now you have to draw that. You have to draw it as a story. And then they were like, oh, this is work today. But... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There's a number of kids who take comics classes because they think it's going to be an easy, fun class. Like how the way like kids took art classes in high school. You know, it's like, oh, I don't have to do anything in here. And then there was those, like the the other thirty percent of the room of kids like me who were like, this is my career path, and we'd be like, shut up, dude, this is serious stuff. You know. Exactly. Anyway, I was yeah, I was very very serious about it as well, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> Whereas for other kids, it was time to nap. Yep. <laughs> All right, so um, that's that. I, I emptied my clip. Uh, that's all I had for today. Uh, but I think those are pr two pretty fun ways to engage with your storytelling stuff, um, in a quick and easy way. And and so for that, for that reason, I want to do this. I'm going to do something different, and I'm going to actually go off mic for a second while we're recording. Okay, Back cool. Here. I am going to pull up the t previous time. Okay. <clears throat> the title. Uh oh, I see Jersey pulling yeah, out so like, boxes in, of in, in my my art cabinet back there. Every time I go to the office supply store, if I see these things for twenty five cents, fifty cents, I grab boxes and boxes and boxes of crayons just for doing those kinds of exercises. So there's this little uh, purchasing tip. Uh, art supplies that I always make sure that I've always got a brand new box of just. I mean, these are like the cheapest of cheap. These are crap crayons but i got them oh wow yeah but i got them for like a quarter so i just always grab a couple boxes so that i always got something to do that kind of noodling around with whenever i need to okay what do you got for is it is it time to close or do you have anything else for us i don't know how long we've been going i think we i think this was good i think we're solid here um it's a it's a um yeah it's a wide open interesting topic and uh what we 
uh, I guess inherently by talking about the topic, we're doing a little bit of a close, wrap mm -hmm. it up kind of thing. But um, I I hope that uh, you know people got the got the impression that uh, I, I mean I don't think there's any cheating unless it's there's something that uh, you've committed to that then you know you just kind of passively avoid it or something. I mean that maybe that's cheating. I don't know. It's hard for me to even define it because um, it's either you 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 got it done and you like what you did, or you didn't. Yeah, <laughs> these crayons smell and, like uh, like elementary school modeling clay. I can't. Oh, that can't okay. Be good. <laughs> uh, well, that's impressive. That I mean, they at least they're they're taking care of the smell aspect of your marketing senses. You know. <laughs> Um, I mean, because they pro it's probably you know made out of like landfill. Grade A quality. <laughs> so. Grade A. I don't even know what that means either. A quarter. Great. Well, that means it's food. The uh, grade A, I think, is sort yeah. of a. Um, isn't that like a USDA sort of uh, <laughs> thing? Yeah, this is FDA approved so crayons. Can... It doesn't say non toxic. Yeah, oh, go. it does say non toxic. Okay, so this, you know. Okay. But I just that's weird because Crayolas, on the other hand, don't smell like that. No, they just smell like normal crayons. Why do these crayons smell like modeling clay? That's weird. Because, you know, like school modeling clay has a very distinct odor. Oh, that's true. It, Wait, uh, I'm just jumping in my... I'm, I'm sure it's just a matter of, uh, a matter of marketing. I, I, I would imagine the smell is a non-toxic additive. It could to, be. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take us off, off topic least. like that. It's just I just noticed that all of a sudden I was like, why do I smell modeling no. clay? It must be these crayons. Um. But yes, okay, so this cheating thing, yes, obviously, there are going to be people, I had friends growing up who drew very crudely when they drew their comics, and they would say, well, that's my style, I got a loose style, you know, and in other words, I'm excusing myself from having to learn some of the basic fundamental aspects of illustration in order to execute some comics. That's fine, uh, but eventually, you know, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you want to take on more challenges. And uh, and, and and conversely, there are going to be times when it's too challenging. And when that happens, uh, it's time to go back to the basics and, and just noodle around with sloppy drawing, doodling, and try to find ways to create a sense of limitation to force yourself to not have to worry about that drawing aspect so you can dive in and get some stuff done. It's a back and forth kind of thing, you know? What are you pulling up? Um. Well, that that whole style thing, I mean... I think you got to be gentle with yourself, but just be on, just be honest yep. about it. I mean, sorry for all the prescriptive advice crap here, but like, it, you know, if you if you're you set a goal and you're avoiding it, in in a in a, in a way that doesn't really help you, you're probably cheating. Whereas if you're trying to you know get things done to get the experience to to be able to you know build up the ability to get to produce something that that's more akin to your taste you do have to finish stuff and you will finish stuff that isn't as good as what you will finish in the future yeah. um and i'm living proof <laughs> as am i <laughs> uh it, yeah I, I i got i got another fire lit under me the other day um to post all of my old work online i think i'm gonna go ahead and do it i'm gonna uh maybe try to post them on my uh, Comics Are Great site or something, because Anne was telling me how delighted she was that she that Faith Aaron Hicks had a bunch of her first web comics up on her website, and now Faith Aaron Hicks is, is enjoying all this great success in her work. She's being published by First Second, one of the great best comics publishers in the country, in my opinion. Um, and yet, you look at this old work of hers, and you could see that, whoa, when she started out, she had a lot to figure out. It's a great signal for other people to see that everybody starts someplace you know <laughs> everybody who's achieved any kind of success yeah. is living proof of this and if there's anything that 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 pushes my buttons it's when uh somebody says like well that's all well and good for so and so oh no you didn't just say that you didn't just say that there's like there's some like uh all all animals are created equal but some are more equal than others don't say that that book scared the hell out of me so <laughs> Uh, yeah, ex but I, I, I love that, um, and we should totally put put a link to her stuff in the show notes. Um, I need to um, I need to check to to check out that stuff because it has. Uh, I mean, frankly, my old work. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it, it scared the heck out of me to to keep it out there and whatnot. And I wrestled back and forth, and you know, eventually, obviously, I chose to you know print it 
as is and, and collected as it's an honest document of both the story and of mm-hmm. my work. And yeah, you've got to finish and is is not producing it to what I was hoping to arrive at in the future cheating also? Mm-hmm. No. Right. <laughs> it's where I was at. And uh Yeah. Well, I think you should pull up on the screen the uh lean into art store that you put together. Oh yeah. Sweet. Let's yeah, let's, let's do look that. at it because it's it's uh it's a pretty thing to see. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Uh the leanintoart.com slash workshops. There's an easy URL to remember, everybody. And look at this neat Yay. thing you made where you can cross reference. You can cross, like, you can choose the topic you're interested in. So, like, at the top of the screen, it says comics, writing, drawing, art theory, digital painting, uh, Adobe tools, game design, web design. You click on those, and it'll automatically reconfigure the store to just show you the stuff that, that pertains to those subjects. And, uh, gosh, 25 bucks to get one of the time shifted classes. That's a steal. Don't you think? I think. Oh yeah, and I mean, it, we 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 strive to produce uh, materials that are that are affordable, but at the same time, you know, we're we're working on making a fair trade. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I, purchasing uh, any workshop, whether it's one that's c- upcoming, like Jersey's uh, Fatam, a hands-on approach to designing sound elements in Adobe Illustrator. Um, so that one, you're like, what, 30 to $84? What does that mean? Um, so if you click purchase, you'll see on the actual, uh, you know, checkout form, the, uh, the details there. And, um, of course, I'm streaming on two computers and all That's, that stuff, so my internet connection is yeah. feeling a little bit... Yeah, because there's there's less than spry. there's different ways to engage with the class. You can take it in a purely time-shifted manner. You can take it in a semi-time-shifted manner or the full-on live uh, manner and all those different things have different values that they offer. And the, the, so as a result, they, they cost different amounts. Um, so yeah, and there's even a video preview of that class, but yeah, so that one's coming up in January. There's still time to sign up. If you guys want to take a, uh, a really in-depth sound design class, I mean, I promise to go into some really wacky Willy Wonka areas of designing sound. Uh, but then, but that's, that's that's just one of the classes coming up. We've also got you know like there's 18 different uh, bundles essentially on the Lean Into Art Store, uh, ranging from 25 yep. bucks to 200 bucks. But uh, you know like in the case of like the hundred dollar classes, that's because there's four sessions. You're getting like eight hours or five hours or whatever of uh, workshop content. Yeah, depending on the on the class. Yeah. So, but which is you know sessions and assignments and. Uh, and interaction on the forums. All of, purchasing any of these, you you have access to the forums. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff out mm-hmm. there. Um, but then, you know, purchasing a class gives you the support of well, as you go through your work in that class, mm-hmm. the, you know, putting your assignments and getting feedback on them and all that. Um, we are there for you. <laughs> and um, so yeah, just for the <laughs> folks listening in the audio, I just want to list off some of the classes that are available in here. So lettering in Adobe Illustrator yeah. is a time shifted course. Uh, an introduction to the super rad world of color by Kevin Cross, color theory class. Ha- a hands-on class, coloring in Adobe Photoshop Elements, where I walk through my process of doing uh, cell shaded coloring style. But then there's uh, the the games that I mentioned earlier, headline mashup, sequences and consequences. Uh, Kim Holm of cartoonarchy.com did some really cool classes for us like digitally organic art some some tricks and tips with resources on how to make your digital illustrations look more like they were done on paper the dramaturgy of silly which is a great improvisational story building exercise rob's excellent excellent class making video games from comics which is a sort of a, a thousand foot fundamental view of how to think about taking your so you made a comic you got characters that you love you made t-shirts and everything uh, I want to get start getting into this transmedia stuff, make some video games and things about my characters to get people continuously engaged with my fictional world. I took this workshop. I can report, and I would say this even if I wasn't uh, one of the heads of Lean Into Art. Uh, I learned a lot in... I learned how I was fundamentally misthinking how to make a video game. I was thinking of, well, I'll just copy what so-and-so did, and I'll just do that kind of thing. When there, uh, there, just as there are fundamental principles in comic storytelling, there's fundamental principles in game design, game theory, and how to get a reader or a player or user engaged with the content. So I can't recommend that one enough. That one was mind blowing to me. So I think if you you you're uh, you, 
you're writing your story in your comic, you can take that your your same voice and make it interactive yeah. too. You don't have to just put your assets on top of Pac-Man or Space Invaders. Right. Basically. Right. So you can come up with something brand new that even maybe even works with some of the similar game mechanics, but you can bring sure. your own again talking about getting to your voice. You're bringing your voice to this thing, and I think the neatest one. But is easily it's the most expensive one is the Creative Topics Variety Pack, where it's like eleven hours of content. If you want to spend a whole weekend with me and Rob, <laughs> <laughs> so what do we talk about? It's, uh, it really is an interesting bunch of variety too. I mean, yeah, and it's uh, three three of these are are presented by Jersey, and three are presented by me. Um, you know, we cover what visual rhythm, so you're going to you know deal a lot with uh, you know designing your pages and how can you how can you affect that? Um, introduction to art automation. So if you're curious about how do you, uh, how, you know, you have some repetitive things when you're when you're making your art projects, exporting your comic, whatever. You you know, obviously I, I'm a proponent of uh, quit doing that. Automated. Yeah. Um, creating a cast of characters. I um, that was a really fun one. Oh, was that the one where we improv an entire story from scratch? Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Improv an entire story, and, and so I mean, it was cool as far as seeing that story, pro, you know, progress, but also that process and the, the, like, you know, the, the emotional anchor points on the different characters and whatnot. Really good, good writing stuff. I mean, um, so I was very much affected, like, as a creator by being part of the thirty classes. Yeah, me too. Uh, in thirty days, uh, just so much interesting material. Uh, writing and drawing serial comics, dramatic reveal, advice on, you know, dealing with. Um, how do you keep the interest going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, intro to HTML5 comic UI. You know, if you want to get your hands dirty on the JavaScript and CSS and all that stuff. Uh, if you don't want to spend the rest of your life yeah. beholden to a web guru or a, uh, a widgetized CMS that can only do so much. Uh, we were talking off mic about we that before this episode. I love widgetized CMSs, uh, but uh, when you overly compartmentalize something like that, it makes customizing a whole new problem. Uh, you can customize, yep. you can customize like crazy, but only to a point when you've broken everything into a certain sized box. And uh, and exactly, so it's it's trying to take uh, take that power for yourself. Um, or combine them or whatever, right? Um, obviously, I do love the uh, uh, pre-built CMSs and whatnot. Sure. Um, using uh, um, artificial deadlines as a creative tool. Yep. That was a fun session as well. So, um, gosh, that's a lot. That's like a basically a, a complete overview of creative storytelling for somebody in the internet age. Yeah. So... Um, there's there's a lot of fun stuff. I mean, we could walk walk through them yeah. all. Like, what's um, let's see. Obviously, Krishna Sadasivam's creating crazy characters. Yep. Uh, we mentioned Brandon uh, Dayton's foundation of dynamic line work. Uh, Tyler James, like, uh, we have so many interesting takes on develop character development. Mm -hmm. All of them are really useful, right? So Tyler James goes through a bunch of uh, handy techniques in his creating compelling characters, yep. and. Uh, I think we at least covered all the different creators. Uh, Casey Van Heist manga is is a medium, not a genre. That's um, a good one too, where it's essentially a presentation on what we can learn from breaking down what manga does best. And then she throws out a challenge at the end where she presents a couple different comics pages and says, interpret this one with some of the, the viewpoints and uh, affordances that we discovered through our exploration of manga. And uh, got some neat stuff in the in the forum from that so okay i think that 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 serves as our commercial for this is like yeah you know uh the reason we point people at this is that that's what we want the lean art cast is a component of a larger thing that we're trying to build here this learning network and part of that learning network is these workshops that we spend a lot of time uh putting together and the uh, the workshop leaders spent a lot of time developing their content and i think we've got a really cool thing there a lot of really really awesome content that we're just going to keep adding to and for the folks who said oh, well, I, I don't have the time to do 30 classes in 30 days. Well, that was an event, but it was an event also to bring about this thing where now we have this page where you can just pick and choose which things you want to participate in uh, or you know expose yourself to. And yeah, Rob built this really awesome thing where you can break it down by different uh, subject types by clicking the buttons, or you can just search for instructor names in the search field, or even, yeah, like Rob just wrote the word Photoshop 
into the search field and it pulled up Christian Sinassians creating crazy characters and digitally organic art with Kim Holm. So neat. Very cool store. You did it. Awesome. Good job, Rob. Collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I like them all too. There's a lot of neat stuff in there. I'm looking forward to adding more to it. So uh, that's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. Everything we do is at leanintoart.com. Or you, get, you, get, you had your hand up. You are going to say something. One little follow-up. We talked about making uh, this this episode was going to be possibly about uh, the um, upcoming workshop I'm working on, which is actually uh, expounding on uh, uh, making video games from comics. And uh, that's nah, still in progress. We're working on it. We're excited to get to it, but, um, you know. Yeah. No wine before it's time kind of thing. Oh, so, thank you, Palmasan. There's plenty of other topics to cover in the meanwhile. So sorry for the pre uh, the little bit uh, premature tease, but it's coming. Yeah, it's just that we want to do it right. Uh, yeah. So, yes, the next one will be an audio episode followed by a video episode and it it could be about the video games but you know another thing they could do is if anybody has something they want to hear us ruminate about or do some visual stuff with you can email us leanintoart at gmail.com oh there's a contact page on the lean into art site too there you go and there's that yeah and absolutely whatever uh whatever you're comfortable with here um but we do want to we do want to hear from you so, okay, and then if you like what we talk about but you don't want to buy a class uh, but you still want to help us out, a great thing that you could do is go to iTunes and give us a star review. That's the way people, that's one of the number one ways people discover podcasts. So, uh, or, you know, fail, if you want to be extra ambitious, you could uh, post a link on your site or in your social media feed, say, I like this thing, it's cool. Uh, you could say, uh, Jersey talks too much and his head is really pink and Rob is really cool and laid back and I wish that he would teach me martial arts. Something like that. There, there's your pre-boxed, <laughs> your pre-boxed uh, uh, statement that you just plug in. Okay, you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm funny, but I'm I'm excited. Uh, oh, one last thing I can point people at. If anybody likes hearing me talk a lot, I was interviewed on another podcast, and I should give the guy a plug because he was he was very oh, cool. kind to me. It's a podcast called Podcast Squared. I'll link to it in the show notes, but you can just do a search on iTunes for Podcast Squared, or do a Google search for Podcast Squared. And uh, I was in the latest episode, the December 19th episode. Uh, I think it's called, like, We Can Make It After All. Uh, about a half-hour interview with me. And uh, I don't think I let the guy ask more than three questions because every question he asked made me talk for about 15 minutes. So if you want to know why I do this podcasting stuff and how I think it applies to other media and how where I think podcasting's future lies, you can hear me talk a lot about that on Podcast Squared, the December 19th episode of 2011 so sweet yeah i gave a plug to lean into art too i'll have to check that out. i talked about i talked about this I talked about lean into art for sure so okay uh so be careful you may be caught in a recursive loop of jerseys <laughs> endorsing two different projects back and forth <laughs> and you can't get out you can't get out unless like you that, cheat it's like that yeah oh hey nice nice little knit it together dun, dun, at the dun. end <laughs> Around the tree and through the hole, pull it tight, and there you go. I did it! All right. Uh, thanks for downloading and listening, everybody. Thanks for watching, for those who watch the video. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Actually, I'm going to do that again. Okay, bye.